Thank you, worship team. Good morning. Glad that you're here with us today. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to the book of Isaiah. We'll be in chapter 53. Today is Palm Sunday, so some 2,000 years ago, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey's colt, hailed as their new king. He, they believed their Messiah was going to be a military and a political ruler, and uh, so they were treating him as such, but he did not come to rule at least not on that particular incarnation. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about why he did come. As you're looking for Isaiah chapter 53, let me share a quick story with you. In 1949, a 16-year-old young man in Tennessee named John Jr. Courier was sentenced to decades in prison. He had killed another man in an argument while he was drunk and uh, did not have any recall of the events at all. And so he settled into prison prison and uh, did what all other prisoners do, and that is counted the days and hoped for his release. And 14 years later, Courier was offered the opportunity to participate in what was kind of a work release type of a program. And under the new program, uh, low-risk inmates were permitted the opportunity to apply for manual labor jobs at local farms and ranches, and uh, the farmers and the ranchers uh, if they hired them, agreed to pay them $100 a month and to also provide them room and board in exchange for their work. They couldn't leave. They had to stay there and they had to serve out their sentence uh, doing this work. But it got him out of prison. And so Courier went ahead and applied for the program. He landed a job cleaning stalls and doing chores and other maintenance for a wealthy breeder of Tennessee walking horses. And although some claim that uh, Courier was treated very well by the family, uh, he says he was not. He says he was forced to live in a drafty trailer. His showers consisted of standing in front of that trailer using a cold garden hose. And he said he was actually only paid $5 a week at the time. And then in 1968, almost 20 years after his conviction and sentencing, his status changed. We're in the book of Isaiah. Who was Isaiah? Isaiah was a prophet a man commissioned by God to share God's messages with people, especially in the Hebrew nations of Israel and Judah. God told Isaiah, tell my people that judgment is coming. And it's not just coming for the people you would expect me to judge. It is coming for all who say that they follow me but in reality, follow themselves. The judgments that God promised had been coming for centuries due to the sin of the people of the nation of Israel and of Judah. And those judgments included periods of great spiritual and emotional darkness, displacement of huge numbers of people to other nations, destruction of many, if not most, of the cities in Israel and Judah, and the death, the premature death, of many, many people. But embedded in these ominous prophecies, which extend for almost 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah, are moments of hope, unexpected promises of a Messiah, a Savior who was coming to restore Israel. And perhaps the most striking example of a prophecy about that Messiah who was coming is found in the passage from Isaiah. Isaiah 52, verse 13 through Isaiah 53, verse 12. The details that are expressed in that passage are incredibly accurate. Even though that particular set of prophecies was given to the people of Israel and Judah some 700 years before Jesus set foot among them. Contrary to what the Jews of Isaiah's day believed, the coming Messiah would not rule with military might. He would not rule with political savvy. Instead, he would be known as the suffering servant. 
This particular passage that we've been looking at for the last several weeks contains five stanzas of three verses each. And so we've been tackling one set of three verses each week and looking at how Jesus fulfilled the prophecies that Isaiah spoke. At the same time, we've been looking at the book of Leviticus, in particular the first five chapters. And in those chapters, we find descriptions of five Five distinct types of offerings or sacrifices that the ancient Israelites were required to make. Each offering met a specific need that they had. And when you lay Isaiah 52 and 53 next to these five kinds of offerings, you begin to see that Jesus, the Messiah who is described in Isaiah, actually fulfills or meets the needs behind each of those kinds of offerings. He's the ultimate and final offering, not just in one way, but in five ways. And in doing that, he meets needs that you and I, people in this era, have, as well as all people in history. So we have five weeks, five stanzas, five offerings, and five needs and we are in week four but the more I studied the last couple of stanzas the more I realized they had to be tackled together if I separated them it would make them disjointed it would make it confusing it would even seem a little repetitive and so as I was looking at these I realized that it would be better to combine weeks four and five today and on Easter to talk about the resurrection in light of the entire passage so the people of Isaiah's day had five needs and you and I have the same five Five needs. We've talked about three of those needs so far in this series. What are the final two needs? Need number four is this, to experience life as God designed me, I need to be purified or cleansed of my sin. I need to be purified or cleansed of my sin. And need number five is to experience life as God designed me. I need the penalty for my sin to be paid. Two needs, number four and number five. I need to be purified or cleansed of my sin. I need the penalty for my sin to be paid. Purification and payment. Now, as Christians, we think of that as one big thing. We tend to treat that as one significant change within us. And it is true that it happens in one moment, that it is one contiguous set of circumstances that occur to us. But those two things, purification and payment, though they are linked and though they are inseparable, are not the same thing. If we got one without the other, we would still be stuck in our sin problem. So let me explain that as we unpack the remainder of Isaiah chapter 53. So look at verse 7. It says this about the Messiah. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Now, this was a great metaphor for the Israelites. Uh, they were sheep herders. They did have cattle, but there seems to be a heavier emphasis on sheep and goats. And so they knew that when you took a sheep or a goat to be sheared or even to be killed for purposes of food, that the sheep did not complain. Why not? Because they did not understand what was coming for them. They didn't say, why are you doing this to me? This is unfair. I don't deserve this. And so God, in describing this coming Messiah, says, your Messiah will be like a lamb being sheared or being slaughtered. He will go to that moment with silence. Did Jesus fulfill that prophecy? 
On the night before his crucifixion, Jesus was unlawfully arrested. He was illegally tried in several courtroom environments with different sets of religious leaders, and he was eventually condemned to death. But after multiple witnesses made false and contradictory accusations about him, the high priest became frustrated. And in Matthew chapter 26, verses 62 and 63, it says, and the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. The Messiah was silent like a lamb being led to his death. Now, Jesus wasn't silent the entire time, but he was very selective about the moments that he chose to speak. And when he did, in almost every case, he spoke in such a way to make sure that the witnesses who heard him would have no doubt later who he actually was. However, when he was accused, he remained silent in order to fulfill Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. Look at Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8. It says, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? God said through Isaiah to his people, the Messiah is going to be taken away. He's going to be cut off from the land of the living. He will be killed by forces of oppression and of judgment. Now, the nation of Israel was one of two Hebrew nations. They had split back in the time of the, one of the sons of uh, Solomon, Rehoboam, and the northern nation, which was still called Israel, fell to the Assyrian Empire during Isaiah's lifetime. Then the Babylonian Empire began to rise in power also during Isaiah's lifetime. And by the time of Isaiah's death, they were the dominant power in the region. They were the ominous one that after Isaiah died came in and overran the nation of Judah. So in Isaiah's day, there were two huge oppressors back to back, the Assyrians and the Babylonians. And when God says through Isaiah, by oppression and by judgment, your Messiah will be cut off from the land of the living, they would naturally have assumed that one of these powerhouses would have been the culprits to kill their Messiah. Did Jesus fulfill that prophecy? Yes. In Jesus' day, the powerhouse of oppression was an even more impactful, more organized, more thorough empire called the Roman Empire. And in Israel, the representative of Rome was Pilate the governor. He authorized the crucifixion of Jesus. He's the one who had Jesus taken away and cut off from the land of the living. Matthew chapter 27 verse verses 26 to 31 says, Then Pilate released for the crowd Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him, and they took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. Jesus was taken away and cut off from the living by oppression and by judgment. The oppression was Rome. The judgment came from the Jewish 
Old Testament law through the misunderstanding and myth misapplication of the religious leaders. And all of that happens so that the Messiah, Jesus, would fulfill Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8. Look at chapter 53, verse 9. It says, And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. The Gospels tell us that after Jesus was crucified and after he died on the cross, he was buried in a rich man's tomb. Matthew chapter 27 verses 57 to 59 says, When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. We know from other gospels that Joseph of Arimathea uh, was both a, a disciple of Jesus, but he was also a secret disciple. He had not yet revealed his desire to follow Jesus to his crowd because his crowd was the Jewish religious council, the Sanhedrin, the highest court in the Jewish culture. He was part of the actual group that sentenced Jesus to death. But one of the gospels tells us he personally did not consent to the death sentence. And after Jesus died, he requested Jesus's body and buried Jesus in his own new and unused tomb, which matches part of verse 9. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 9 says, they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Now, Joseph was not considered wicked either by the Jews, he was part of their religious council, or by Christians, he was a secret disciple of Jesus. So who were the wicked with whom the Messiah would one day be buried according to Isaiah? Some speculate that Isaiah was simply talking about people who were buried in that cemetery around where Jesus was buried, that many of them were probably wealthy people like Joseph and that perhaps they had acquired their wealth by uh, mishandling their money, taking advantage of the poor and things of that nature. But that is pure purely speculation. The better answer is this. In the structure of verse 9, in Hebrew, we see that there's a parallel between the first phrase and the second phrase, and that those two phrases are most likely meant to be matter and antimatter to one another. The first phrase, which says, and they made his grave with the wicked, would be the intention of those who had Jesus killed. They wanted to treat him like a criminal. So as a criminal, they, when they took him down from the cross, they would have thrown him in a mass grave with other criminals, perhaps the other two thieves who were crucified alongside Jesus. But the second phrase shows God, God's intent to bury Jesus in the grave of a rich man, not just rich physically, but because he was now a follower of Jesus, rich spiritually. Jesus fulfilled Isaiah chapter 53, verse 9. And in fact, he fulfilled all three of those verses, 7, 8, and 9. He stayed silent when he was being led away. He gave his life, being taken away and cut off. Uh, by crucifixion, and then he was buried in a rich man's tomb. Why would a Messiah that the Israelites thought was going to be a great military leader, a new king, actually do these things instead? The second half of verse 8 actually tells us why. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. Isaiah, speaking to, speaking to the people for God, said, your Messiah will be silent, he will give his life, and he will be buried. Why? He will do all of that for the transgression of God's people. Jesus did all of that to become an offering for transgression, 
Today we call that a sin offering. Jesus was our sin offering. Now, sin offerings were one of the five kinds of offerings that Leviticus tells us about. In chapter 4 of Leviticus, it describes the process for a common person to make a sin offering. There were special processes for priests and for the community at large. But for people like us, you and I, the rank and file, verses 27 to 31 say this. If any one of the common people sins unintentionally, in doing any one of the things that by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done and realizes his guilt or the sin which he has committed is made known to him, he shall bring for his offering a goat, a female without blemish for his sin which he has committed. And he shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and kill the sin offering in the place of burnt offering. That would be a large altar in the outer court of the tabernacle or temple. And the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pour out all the rest of its blood at the base of the altar. The altar had at each corner a horn, one metal piece, uh, manufa not manufactured, melted into the shape of the altar. And all its fat he shall remove as the fat is removed from the peace offerings. And the priest shall burn it on the altar for a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And the priest shall make atonement for him and he shall be forgiven." So like a person making a whole offering, which we talked about in week one, or a peace offering, which we talked about in week three, the offering giver would bring the animal and prior to it being sacrificed, he would lay a hand on the head of the animal, passing his sin to the animal. And then the priest killed the animal and offered its blood and its fat to God. Now, last week I went into some gory detail about the blood and the fat. What made the sin offering unique, different from what we talked about last week, and particularly on week one, is what the priest did with the blood in the sin offering. Before burning the acceptable parts of the animal, the priest would wipe blood on the horns at the four corners of the altar. The impurity of the sin of the offering giver, which had been passed to the animal when the offering giver laid his hand on the animal's head, would be transferred to the animal. Then the priest would take the blood of the animal and wipe some of it on the horns of the altar, transferring the sin from the animal to the altar, from the blood of the animal to the altar for God to eradicate. In receiving that transfer of sin from himself, ultimately to the altar, the sinner was purified and the impurity of his sin was removed from him. The priest, by doing so, could make atonement for the sinner, and the sinner would be forgiven, which we saw in verse 31. And the priest shall make atonement for him, and he shall be forgiven. Here's the thing we have to remember. True forgiveness requires the one who is forgiving to take the cost of forgiveness upon himself or herself. You and I know that's intuitively true in our relationships with one another. If you say to a person who has hurt you in some terrible fashion, I forgive you, who has to absorb the pain of their act? You do. The one who is making the statement of forgiveness. God in the Old Testament era, would take the sin from the person through the blood of the sinless animal upon himself, within his own domain, domain in other words, in the altar. He would absorb the cost 
of that forgiveness and in so doing would foreshadow for the people what this Messiah who was coming would do in an ultimate and final way when he gave his blood on a cross. When Jesus, the sinless lamb of God, was crucified, his blood became the means by which our sin was passed or transferred from us to him. And because he is God himself, he then could eradicate that sin. Scripture tells us in multiple places that Jesus took our sin upon himself. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24 says, he himself, sorry about that, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, on the cross. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 says, for our sake, he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him, Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. Now, don't be confused by that verse. God did not turn Jesus into an active sinner. What is being said here is that he absorbed or identified so closely with our sin, it became a part of him, not that he himself sinned, but that he took it on himself so that it would be appropriate in Scripture to say God made him to be sin. When our sin was passed to him, we as sinners are then purified of the sin that has been removed. Jesus, our high priest, makes atonement for us as sinners that we might be forgiven. Now, remember when I started, I said that there were two, uh, the people of Isaiah's day had five needs and that there were two left for us to consider. And the last two were this, that I need to be purified or cleansed of my sin and that I need the penalty for my sin to be paid. And I told you those two needs are linked and they are in separable, but they're not exactly the same thing. This sin offering, which would more accurately for a Hebrew be considered a purification offering because it cleansed them from sin, met need number four. What meets need number five? What offering pays the penalty for my sin? Look first at Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10. It says, yet it was the will of the Lord, the will of God to crush him, the Messiah, Jesus. He has put him to grief when his soul, the Messiah's soul, makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Isaiah, speaking God's message to God's people, said, you're going to see this Messiah arrive, and he is not going to do what you expect a Messiah to do. And in fact, when terrible things begin to happen to him, you are going to assume you were completely wrong about him and that he must have been a huge sinner in his own right. Otherwise, God would not allow these things to happen to him. But you will be wrong. It is actually God's will to do these things to him, to crush him, to put him to grief, to cause him anguish. And when that happens, it will in effect make the Messiah become a guilt offering, but not for his own guilt. He will be an offering of guilt for you on your behalf. The Hebrew word that we translate guilt in this particular verse is a word pronounced asham, and it means an offense, it means guilt, it means debt, it means an act deserving retribution, or rather restitution. It describes something which demands payment for a wrongdoing. 
Leviticus chapter 5 describes the purpose of offerings that were made to solve this particular problem, to handle this issue. The fifth kind of offering is called a guilt offering in the book of Leviticus. And verses 14 to 16 of Leviticus chapter 5 say this, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, if anyone commits a breach of faith and sins unintentionally in any of the holy things of the Lord, he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation a ram without blemish out of the flock, valued in silver shekels according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Why does he bring it? For a guilt offering. He shall also make restitution for what he has done amiss in the holy thing. And she, he shall add a fifth to it and give it to the priest. And the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering, and he shall be forgiven. A guilt offering was required any time something was taken from someone else. And there are several scenarios that are played out in Leviticus 5 and 6. Scenarios in which one person takes something inappropriately from someone else. In those cases, you made a guilt offering, but you also made restitution. You gave more back to the person from whom you'd taken something. In the verses I just read, it's speaking specifically of taking something from God, of perhaps consuming a thing that had been dedicated as holy and was set apart for only the priests to use, such as a first fruits offering or a tithe or something of that nature, or doing something like forgetting to observe an important holiday that called attention to what God had done for you. In the case of those things where you had taken something from God, you had stolen his glory from him, then you were supposed to offer, it was mandated that you offer a guilt offering. The guilty one was required to bring not only the animal to be sacrificed, but restitution of one-fifth of the value of what he or she had taken. Now, many years ago, I was uh, at a fast food restaurant, which I'm sure surprises you by looking at me, and I was backing my truck out of a parking place, and I backed into one of these really low-lighted signs that points the way, I think it was probably to the drive-in, and I didn't see it, and I hit it, and I tipped it at a 45-degree angle. And I was in my 20s. I was panicked. I thought, oh no, I'm going to be in real trouble. And so I just left. I took off and I drove away and I never went back to that restaurant again. Was that a sin? Yes. It was unintentional. It was accidental, but I damaged something valuable to the restaurant owners. I took from them what I had no right to take. And so I stand before you as a person guilty of an act deserving restitution. In January of this year, which was some 30 years after that first incident, I drove up to Denver, went to a hospital to visit a woman who was part of our congregation, and I parked in the hospital garage, and as I backed out to leave, I backed my truck into a fire extinguisher box. Don't park behind me. I actually cracked the plastic box. I broke the panel of glass in front of it, and I had flashbacks to this silly restaurant thing from 30 years before. Uh, was that a sin? Yes. It was unintentional. It was accidental. But again, I took something that I had no right to take from those who who owned that particular thing that I took. So at that time, I went back inside, but it was a holiday. I walked into the lobby. There was not a soul to be seen in this hospital lobby. It was like the rapture had happened or something. It was a spooky thing. And so I just went home and then I called the next day and I asked for their security office. And when the guard answered, I said, I broke the fire extinguisher box in your parking garage and I would like to pay for a replacement. And there was a really long pause like the the guard had never heard anything like this before. And then he says, thank you for your honesty. Uh, we'll go check on the box. And if we really think it needs to be replaced, we'll call you and let you know. And they never did. Now, I'm, I think probably in a room of this size, some of you are probably thinking, well, 
Is that really a sin? That's such a small thing. They didn't even think it was a big deal at all. And if we are wondering that, we probably overlook two verses I read earlier today. One is in Leviticus chapter 4.27 and one is in 5.15. They both say basically the same thing. If anyone sins unintentionally, they must make a guilt offering. And now some of us are thinking, wow, if that's really true, that means a lot of things I didn't think were sin are sin. And that's the point. Not only that, but our sin demands restitution. Every sin has a penalty attached to it. We must restore what we've taken and then some. And when we sin against people, that's a lot easier to do. We can usually picture what we need to do to restore things with that person. And oftentimes we can take those steps. Unfortunately, all sin against people is also sin against God. And all sin, no matter how small we think it is, is eternal and infinite in scope. Because it is a sin against an eternal an infinite God. How can we offer restitution or pay a penalty for a sin that is eternal and infinite in scope? We can't. And that's why Jesus, who is eternal and infinite, because he is God himself, had to be our offering for guilt. Isaiah said, God will crush this Messiah. God will put him to grief. And Jesus fulfilled Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10 on the cross when he became not just our whole offering, not just a thanks offering, not just a peace offering, not just a sin offering, but also a guilt offering for us. Why would he do that? He did it because he knew what it would make possible. Chapter 53, verses 10 to 12 say this, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he'll, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. That's us. People have put their faith in Jesus. He shall bear their, our iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil, the blessings with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. God told Isaiah, tell my people judgment is coming, but tell them that a Messiah is coming too. Jesus will be crushed he will be grieved. He will be anguished. And in doing all of that, he will be our guilt offering. And because he was, he this day, now, has many offspring. Those who have put their faith in what he did on the cross to make a relationship with God possible. By bearing our transgressions, our iniquities, by carrying our sins, he will make all of us who believe righteous. And we will share the spoil, the blessings God has promised for those who follow him in obedience. The promise made by God 700 years before Jesus walked among his people was meant to show the people that a Messiah was coming who would meet the needs that they could never meet through the Old Testament sacrificial system. He was coming to take care of once and for all sin and guilt. But many failed then to realize what he was really going to do. And many fail today to realize what he has really done. In 1949, John Currier was sentenced to decades in a Tennessee prison for a murder he did not remember. He was guilty 
but he just did not remember it. 14 years later, he was offered an opportunity to participate in a work release program, and he was hired at a ranch that where they raised Tennessee walking horses. He did chores, he cleaned stalls, all the undesirable things. And according to himself, he was not treated particularly well. But in 1968, nearly 20 years after his conviction, his status changed. Unbeknownst to him, a parole board back at the prison had granted him parole. They had decided he had served enough time. Because he was not on site, they sent a letter to his new parole officer with instructions to read the letter to him. What happened next has been disputed for decades. The parole officer claimed that he drove to the ranch and that he summoned the owner of the ranch and John Courier and read the letter announcing John's release to both men at the same time. Today, the rancher's family insists that they have no record or recollection of that letter ever being delivered or read to the ranch owner. John insists that no one ever came and gave him a copy of the letter or read it to him out loud. Because he did not know about the contents of the letter, he worked at a reduced rate under unpleasant circumstances for 10 more years. He did not know that at least from a worldly view, his sin and his guilt had been paid for. Your sin and your guilt have been paid for fully. Have you embraced that? Would you stand with me?